And we're talking Taste of Cherry from 1997, directed by Abbas Kiarostami. Uh, here's a little synopsis from our friends at Wikipedia, because if I were to just mention what this movie was, it wouldn't take me very long. Right. Mr. Badil, a middle-aged man, drives through Tehran looking for someone to do a job for him, and he offers a large amount of money in return. During his drives with prospective candidates, Badil reveals that he plans to kill himself and has already dug the grave. He needs someone to throw earth on his body after his death. He does not discuss why he wants to commit suicide. His first recruit is a young, shy Kurdish soldier who refuses to do the job and flees from Badil's car. His second recruit is an Afghan seminarist who also declines because because he has religious objections to suicide. The third and is a Ziri taxidermist. He is willing to help Badil because he needs the money for his sick child, but tries to talk him out of it. He reveals that he too wanted to commit suicide a long time ago, but chose to uh, live when he tasted mulberries. The Aziri, promise, uh, Aziri promises to throw earth on Badil if he finds him dead in the morning. That night, Badil lies in his grave while a thunderstorm begins. After a long blackout, the film ends by breaking, I'll just leave it at this for now, the fourth wall. <laughs> <gasps> yeah, okay. I actually, I didn't know if that was um, actually part of the movie or not because I watched this on uh, the Android TV box, yep. which actually, by the way, is working great now. Fantastic. Woo. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, me and roommate Scott watched it on the Android TV box, and then uh, the movie ends, and then it turns into like a behind the scenes, and we're like, wait a second, is this the movie? Is this how this is supposed to be? Uh, so is that actually like how the movie is supposed to end, or is yep. that like just act, like That's some it. bonus stuff? That's the end. Why do they do that? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, RJ. What did you think of Taste of Cherry? What do you, hey, RJ, what do you think of Iranian cinema? <laughs> Iranian cinema. Well, I'm a big fan, uh, especially that Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. That is uh, easily a zero out of five star movie for me. Maybe a one out of five. It's, you, it, it, it's only gotten worse in your mind. You didn't mind it yeah. as much. You just didn't like it. I think I, I think when I watched it, I gave it a two and a half out of five. Okay. Or maybe a three. I thought it was more. Anyways, that's not even really Iranian. Right. Uh, my uh my smart uh fuck what was i talking about i had a smart snappy reply i think it was going to be taste a cherry i could have used a whole bite <laughs> <laughs> take that fans we um, hit you with the wrestling and comics and now now that well uh, you'll have to unpack that one for me um um i like this movie cool i thought it was good yeah uh I really liked the content and the uh, subject matter. Um, I, I think I've mentioned before, like, so when we were talking about, like, Andre Tarkovsky, there was, like, these grand theological, like, posturing things. This movie, I feel like, has some of that, but it's kind of more, I don't want to say grounded or real, because that's just, like, a really lazy way people describe stuff. But I felt I like it was more per- yeah, it personal. Be, I, I think it wouldn't be inaccurate to say that, though. Yeah, I my point, I guess, was I thought they were kind of like covering these weighty topics, but it seemed like a lot more um, like a personal way. Like it's people just kind of talking about real life and you get this diverse cat or like this interesting cast of people he meets. Like you have a young kid in the army, you have like uh, a preacher and then you just have like a dude who's just like an old guy working on the working, you know, so mm-hmm. you get this, like you get this nice play of all these different characters. Um, no, yeah, I, I, uh, I kind of glossed over. I did like this movie. Yeah. I thought it was pretty good. Um, I, I like what they talk about, uh, the copy we watched. Um, it was good. It was a little, I don't want to say like grainy or fuzzy, but it wasn't super like crystal clear. And I kind of, I don't think it was because of the box because mm-hmm. we watched, uh, we watched Red Sh- or I watched Red Shoes last week and it was perfect. Right. So I don't know if it was just maybe like the well, copies that are out there. Yeah. Well, movie, well, taste the, the the Taste of Cherry DVD that Criterion put out in 1999. That's it. There's yep. like there they they haven't put it out again in Blu-ray or anything like that. And I, I who knows mm-hmm. if there's actually an HD copy of this floating around. Um. I mean, I just wound up watching this off of YouTube. Um. And yeah. I mean, it looked yeah. and it looked fine. It wasn't like a I mean a great presentation at the end of the day, but I mean it had subtitles and it played great. Um. And it was yep. a complete movie. Um. It reproduced yep. the like it's got like the weird like 1.66 to 1 ratio which is essentially just full frame and it yeah. looked so it looked fine i was kind of initially worried I'm like oh crap is this full framed and like 
uh, cropped out, but no, it was mm-hmm. it was shot that way and it looked proper. So yeah, I mean, uh, so it's readily available, folks. If you haven't watched it, you can just watch it any day. Yeah, see, that's kind of what I thought because like we streamed it, and I was like, well, I know it's on YouTube, so I'm pretty sure the stream I'm getting is just a YouTube stream, probably. So I was like, I, mean, I think this is probably just like the best quality they have out mm-hmm. there. And I mean, this movie was also like like shot like gorilla yeah, style I, like I it, figured yeah it, a very low budget yeah. i mean like because what do you need to really do i mean it's essentially just driving around the same like i don't know mm-hmm. like square kilometer and right uh, that's about it yeah but uh no yeah i loved seeing um irani and joe montagna drive around for an hour and a half uh <laughs> huh okay. you 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 woke them up you'll you'll see why i say mm. that Okay. Um, two things from a uh, roommate Scott because he watched this with with me that he articulated a little bit better than I did. Yeah. Um, at the start, um, you really kind of feel his perspective. I love that it's like the camera is just kind of on him driving yeah. for like the first twenty minutes, and uh, like we looked at each other, and I was just kind of like, man, I would love if the whole movie was just this. Right. Like, uh, and I'm actually I'm glad they didn't do it the whole yeah. time because what the changes in perspective like with the cameras makes sense and it's kind of a nice break so i think they did a really good job with all that like the way that they either present him and his point of view or when it switches to other characters i thought they did a really good job right so uh scott pointed that out to me and then he also was kind of he was like this i when i went to or started to watch it he's like what are you watching and i was like oh um taste of cherry and i read the description Mm -hmm. he's like you know what that sounds like it sounds like that gus van sant movie from last year but actually done better do you remember that movie gus van sant made a year ago the four it's called like tree of sea of trees or something it had like matthew mcconaughey and ken uh watanabe right or something and uh i remember when that movie came out scott was like really excited for it he's like this Mm -hmm. sounds awesome and then it got like I think it had a zero percent after like uh, it opened, and it was just like holy shit. So we've talked about this many times, and I don't feel this isn't a tangent because uh, old Gus Van Sant's gonna pop up a couple oh, times. He's, I think. he's he's Criterion alumni. So uh, we, uh, me and Scott, have had many discussions about this. We think that he has just been carried his whole career, and anything good is not a result from him. It was because of the material he was given. So. Because I think he's got two or three out of like ten, Gus two Van, or three yeah. good ones out of ten mm, bad ones. Yeah, yeah, we could talk about Gus Van Sant. I we'll, guess. well, we'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll get, get there. okay. Okay. But so my point was, it was he was like, oh, it seems like he just stole the idea, but didn't do it as good. Well, I mean, there was like a pure, there was like this window of time where like everybody was talking about the that Japanese forest. Like it seemed yeah. to be like that was like a big deal. There was like a Vice documentary about it, and like before that, there was like, "Hey, have you heard?" Of, like J- Japan always gets like the weird, like, "Hey, have you heard in Japan? There's this yeah. this forest on Mount Fuji, and people just like go and kill themselves. It's it's so like spiritual. It's so it's so Japanese. I wish I could be yeah. Japanese, <laughs> and it's like it's that shit. And I'm like, I'm sure Gus Van Sant went. Yeah, I, I, I wish I was Japanese. Same. And like he, and he, and he, but he, but he actually, as a filmmaker, he went and made a movie, which is cool. But it yep. sounds like he did make a good one because he's like a very uh, coin flip of a type of guy. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That that was my point. Yeah. He's a coin but toss, uh, right? so uh, uh, again, I, I I drift. The the last things I'll say because I actually I don't have a lot of notes because I just enjoyed watching the movie. Uh, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the like earth and dust theme and like the Iranian setting where everything is just kind of like a wasteland. Yeah. There's like a super bland palette to everything. My, my, my like first note is Iran, desolate desert. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, exa- exactly. Like yeah. it's such a bland palette, but it works so good when the old guy starts talking about like optimism and changing your perspective. And then like he's driven this like route like for an hour of the movie already and you see the same stuff over and over again. But then when you, the old guy talks about perspective, it like totally changes the environment. You get like wildlife and trees and water and like stuff like that. So I was like, Oh, that's nice. Like see what they did. Mm-hmm. Like this whole time he's been driving and like hating it. So all you've seen is this, this like desolate bland desert. But then when he's like, you know, there's good stuff out there. Then you see some trees and you hear some birds and you're like, yeah, there is good stuff out there. Yeah. And then, uh, no, yeah, I like the way it ends. Um, other than the weird fourth wall break that you talked about. Mm-hmm. However, I did, I do think, I, I re, at first I thought it was a memory 
that the guy was having. And mm. I was like, ooh, I really like the idea of memories being like old VHS footage. But uh, then it was like I saw the camera crew and I was like, oh, wait, that's not his memory. <laughs> so I don't I don't really know. Remember that time movie. I made that movie? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, because like it started and it was like the picture was different. And then it was yeah. like the army walk in. And I was like, oh, maybe it was like the story he told about how he used to be like a part of that. And they used to count. So I thought it was like a memory. But then it was like, oh, no, wait, this is just us. We forgot to cut this part out of the movie. Mm. Maybe. Maybe. They, they fucked up. <laughs> They're like, oh, man. Oh, let's just take this shop. This is bringing us a con. Oh, one of the Palme d'Or. Oh, we forgot this ending is still. This weird thing we at for, the end is there. We forgot. And uh, I didn't look it up because uh, I hate when people are like, ending explained. Mm. But uh, this one uh, I, I didn't get. So I was like, huh. Maybe I, I'll figure it out one day. Yeah, it's. I don't think there's any clear cut explanation of it. Um, so my notes were also quite sparse because I actually just enjoyed watching the movie. Um, nice. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I I feel like I made the mistake of like looking up what this movie was about beforehand. But I mean, yeah. whatever. I mean, like if you click on Letterbox, and it tells you in one sentence what's this movie about, and then yep. like you don't realize until you start watching the movie that. Oh, you're not supposed to know what he's doing because scenes Until, play pl- scenes play differently when you aren't aware of what is happening. Because so like there's the scene where he's just driving around and he seems to be just like cruising men and you're yeah. like and, and, he's, <laughs> and he's like looking around and of course like my mind is like well where are all where's like there's no women in this I'm like oh wait it's Iran <laughs> yeah there's there's no women just wandering around and particularly in this like uh like industrial area where it's like i don't know is this like a quarry and it's just these guys just like clumping at rocks that's a job i guess and like i don't know if they're farmers whose job is just like chomp at like cl- you know pick at rocks p- like yeah, you clump said at the, the hillsides and stuff and then help people with their cars and be security yeah. guards for like emptiness um mm-hmm. so th- that whole th- the whole like, knowing what the movie was going in i kind of was like oh this like scene where he's like hey Hey, uh, you need mo- you need a ride. Hey, you need some money. And the guy's like, "I'm gonna yeah. punch you in the fucking face." And you're like, "Oh." He's like, "Whatever, okay." And you're like, "Oh, <laughs> what is this movie?" And then of course, yeah. Uh, then he finally does manage to pick him up, and it's like kind of like you're watching it, thinking like, "Oh, he's talking to the people." And it's like it's I always cruising. think of like. Um, like back to my drama 1000 days about like acting and like the whole idea of like getting your, like the upper hand and lower hand and like getting like trying to convince people to do stuff. And so I'm watching it for like that actorly sort of stuff. And, uh, and you're like, Oh, like, like, like the acting considering, I don't know if there's like, like a lot of professional actors in the movie, but like, I thought that like the, um, the Kurdish soldier was actually really good. He played like, um, N- nervous and shy mm. and awkward so well like there's so many shots of him like yes. think like con- like he looked like he was really like he he didn't know he was in a movie and this was happening yep. and he like ran the fuck out of there like it played it was awesome like i thought that was like really mm-hmm. well done um and then uh yeah so my the thing i was very excited about watching this movie and it, it hit me instantly was like oh man this movie feels so modern it feels so contemporary yeah. and it's like uh in watching the criterion creep proper like it seems like it's been a while since we've seen yeah. something like made in the 90s um yes and like so I, I think i'm like well we've watched like silence of the lambs we've seen robocop and even like the john woo stuff uh, mm-hmm. but yeah like it's like we've had a long streak of like stuff that's like i guess fishing with john was also contemporary that would have been like the most yeah. recent thing but it was like a yeah. television show but like watching like a movie that like this movie feels like it would have it could be still made like two years ago and it would feel the same way like nothing you wouldn't change anything about the actual shooting um this is like what an independent movie looks like shot in the 90s like movies like this seem to be like coming out all the time and getting showing up at festivals um Right. Yeah. So like that to me, I was like, I was like, oh, it's like I find this just so immediately more watchable. And like, I don't know. It's like that thing about like, oh, movies are old, and if you don't like old movies, you're a philistine. Mm -hmm. But like, there is something to like watching like a new movie and like how much easier it is to watch like a a new movie. And I don't know if it's just like palette um, or like just like. But, or like just the sophistication. Editing. Yeah, it's like the sophistication of editing and storytelling and the way things are shot in like a, mm-hmm. I don't know, there's more warmth to it and more of like a sense of space, the way that people understand space now. Whereas like, say something like with, Henry V, um, that yeah. that movie was like from a period of time when people were still a lot more accustomed to watching things on stage. 
Mm-hmm. And like movies kind of were like starting looking at, like starting to look a certain way, but they still looked like movies. Whereas this movie doesn't really feel like a movie. It feels like uh, footage of like an event that actually happened. If that makes sense. Right. Yeah. I, I do understand what you're saying. Cool. That does make sense. Nice. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so like, and of course, like I realized that this was like the newest movie that would have been ever released by Criterion at the time that it came out mm. in 1999. Because cool. yeah, it was only like two years old, uh, and yeah, it had won the Palme d'Or, uh, the big big award at Cannes, um, and yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, there, I've, I have something to say about that as well uh, when we get yep. to who hated this movie. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you're, I'm not sure if you're aware of that this that story, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, at some point I just kind of like wasn't really running notes, and I was just kind of going along for the ride. Um, yep. and like, yeah, I mean, it's just a series of conversations with guys. And, uh, I mean, he, I mean, by the, when the first person he really speaks to is the Kurdish soldier, he lays out yep. the movie and then yeah. he fails. And then he has to find another guy. We get like a scene where he like talks to a security guard and then he talks to another, like an Afghan guy that's like there, um, mm-hmm. cause, cause his buddy's lonely and they're both lonely. And I started thinking about this like idea of like middle-aged men who are just lonely in this like, uh, Muslim culture and like yeah. trying to like extrapolate like what that sort of life would be like. Um, Kind of like what we do here. That's right. <laughs> With the, mm-hmm. But we're secular here, folks. <laughs> yes. Um, and then, like, so that doesn't work out. He has to abandon that uh, angle. And then he finds the uh, academic taxidermist from the uh, local mm-hmm. university, I guess. And uh, we get, and that's, like, the extended part of the movie. And, I mean, I'd say that that, that whole sequence does play long. Like, a little it's, bit. It, it's very extended. Um, I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, though, like if you fade in or out of it, like it doesn't really change the way the movie plays at all. Um, yep. Yeah, it's a different. I agree. It's a different kind of boring, I guess. Because I mean, it's like, <laughs> but I mean, it's good. Like, it's still an interesting conversation. I mean, it all depends on how interested you are, I guess, in the story at that point. And I think like the direction and editing and pacing up to that point is fairly good. It's like straightforward. That I think it, at that <laughs> point it has won you over and drawn you in. Um, and then, yeah, you, you get to the ending. Um, the last shot we see in the movie proper is, uh, Mr. Uh, Badil, uh, sitting in his hole in, in this like desert hole under mm-hmm. uh, a tree. And he's him just like looking up and you're like kind of wondering, and then it goes to darkness and then mm-hmm. you hear some sounds. Uh, you don't hear like a gunshot. You're like, not even sure like how he's like going to kill himself at least like that's sleeping my... pills sleeping pills okay he, yeah he, he mentions he's going to take all his sleeping pills okay i might yeah i probably yep. missed that bit because like, you didn't even watch the movie uh, did you i didn't even watch it my, <laughs> my, my hand is uh overplayed um yeah. and then yeah we cut to like camcorder footage of like the movie set like the the this the area that they've been filming everything in um <laughs> and like it completely abandons uh the narrative you see mm-hmm. uh, Mr. Badil, uh, Mr. Uh, <laughs> Homeon Urshadi. He's just like up and Say about. Say that again. <laughs> Homeon Urshadi. Okay. Uh, uh, he's just like up and about walking and some, having mm-hmm. a cigarette. And he's just like waiting for scenes. And then like uh, I'm assuming the uh, director, he's just like on a um, uh, little two-way radio to the soldier saying, all right, stop the scene. You can just stand around there. And yeah, the movie just like, oh. Now it's like almost like a behind the scenes bit with uh, the crew just like milling about and people going up the road. And uh, that's the, the, the end of the movie, um, them filming Taste of Cherry. So mm-hmm. we're left with a lack of resolution, I guess, of what happened if he took sleeping pills, if uh, yep. that's the end or and, uh, whether or not he gets buried uh, in his hole. And I guess it's, it's left up to the viewer, RJ, uh, how it all plays out. And I guess the end of this movie says, did it really matter? And I don't Ooh. know. How, how, how do you feel about that type of, uh, that type of ending? Uh, I like ambiguous endings. Okay. I think, I think it fits with like, it, it shows what kind of person you are, I guess. It's like the perspective thing. Glass half full or glass half empty, I guess. 
that's a new thing I just I just came up with on the spot. You just that's not s- yeah s- struck that your on your own. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, exactly. No, I think it's I think it's like what the old guy was talking about. He's like, it's just a matter of perspective. Like, do you are you like optimistic or mm. pessimistic? Like, how do you see the world? So I think for some people they're like, yeah, no, he totally like found a reason to live. And then some people will be like, that guy's dead. Mm-hmm. So, no, I like ambiguous endings. You make it, you get to choose your own adventure, like those old Goosebumps books. <laughs> so, I, I like that because I like those books too. Cool. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I always like those endings bother me in the sense that when I hit those moments, I'm always like, oh, God, I feel like I'm going to have to, like, turn and explain the ending after the movie's over to somebody. Sure. Um, that's, like, been my life, like, introducing uh, certain people that I work for during the summer to, uh-huh. like, more ambitious kind of filmmaking. And I always get this, like, look like, just, like, dead-eyed look. I'm like, hey, so did you watch this movie? And they go, well, what's with the frogs at the end, Jarrett? <laughs> Are you like, talking about Magnolia? <laughs> uh, spoilers, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, so I get that sort of thing. What's the, like, I get like people looking at me, what are you thinking about? You're so smart. You have to explain it to me. Yeah. I'm like, well, I don't fucking know either. I mean, like that's sometimes like, I don't know. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. I have to think about it for a bit. Maybe I'll never think about it again. I, I, I don't know. It's a roll of the dice. And sometimes it's like, oh, that's kind of novel. I mean, like nowadays though, I don't know. It seems like the ambiguous ending is almost like a, it's not like every movie has it, but it does seem kind of played. And I don't know how, like, I'm curious, like how this worked in 1997, uh, mm-hmm. obviously it won the palm door. So I guess maybe people were more into it at that point, but I could feel like some people might've had a, some issue, some umbrage with, uh, mm-hmm. this sort of this ending that's like kind of jars no you, closure. That, that jars you out of the experience yeah. and you're like, Whoa, wait, what, what, well, what is this? Is this a cheat? Are they trying to get out of like committing to the ending? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know, man. That's why I was, I was really like, not like taken. Well, I guess taken out. Like you said, I was just like, I don't, I was like, what's going on? Yeah. What is this? Is this part of the movie? I don't know. <laughs> Where are we? What's your name? <laughs> Yeah, cherries. Cherries. Yeah, there wasn't a single fucking cherry in this liar movie. You know, see, hey, that's that tells you something. It's an absence. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Minimalism. Yeah. Ex- well. Existential <clears throat> questions. <laughs> oh. There we go. Our time. That we're back. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, RJ, who hated this movie? Well, hmm. uh. Chicago Sun Times uh, critic Roger Ebert <laughs> gave this movie one star. Oh, uh, that guy's a, a hack. Upon upon its release, um, I'll uh, I'll just jump right to uh, this one section, which I believe is right out. This is the Wikipedia featured paragraph. Sure. Uh, I understand intellectually what Kiorostami is doing. I am not impatiently asking for action or incident. What I do feel, however, is that Kiorostami's style here is an affectation. The subject matter does not make it necessary and is not benefited by it. If we're to feel sympathy for body, wouldn't it help to know him more about him? To know, in fact, anything at all about him? What purpose does it serve to suggest at first he may be homosexual? Not what purpose for the audience, what purpose for Badi himself? Surely he must be aware his intentions are being misinterpreted. And why must Kirostami's camera crew a tiresome distancing strategy to remind us we are seeing a movie? If there is one thing Taste of Cherry does not, in, does not need, it is such a reminder. The film is such a lifeless drone that we experience it only as a movie. Uh, well, th- uh, keep in mind. So RJ, keep in mind that Roger Ebert uh, considers La Dolce Vita a great film and gave that for film four stars. Yeah. Okay. So here, here's the here's the score with Roger Ebert. Raj, uh, big Raj, old old Raj. Yeah, I agree with him a lot of the time, but uh, he is a wild card. Mm. Uh, he gave as you showed once he gave spawn i think a three out of four 
I believe, yeah, uh, maybe three, three stars out of four, yeah. which uh, I think is a little low. I would have given it a four out of four. Mm. Uh, but he also gave uh, one of the worst movies of all time, uh, Happiness, a four out of four stars. So oh, uh, he he can't be trusted in any right. So <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I get like some of the stuff he's saying, but like. I find it a little surprising that he like hated this movie. And RJ, to correct you, uh, he gave Spawn three and a half stars out of four. Oh, well, there you go. Well, there you go. Near, so that's, that... near perfect. Yes. Yeah, so on that right, I agree with him. Um, okay. So the second part of this I'll mention is that so like part of his review is like he actually like uh, kind of shit talks uh, some fellow critics, uh, Jonathan Rosenbaum of the Chicago reader also like fairly noted, uh, film critic in yeah. his own right. Uh, he was one of, uh, uh Orson Welles's boys back in the day. Um, uh, he loved this movie and his tastes definitely run far more, um, ultra, a little bit more avant-garde. Uh, he likes to, he has a problem with like how, um, mainstream critics are and like how they seem to like be there to just like prop up studio stuff and to sell DVDs. And he's like, so he's like kind of always like kind of a contrarian, but this movie like totally is up his alley. He's a big new wave dude. Um, so he, in his response, uh, and this is again, uh, off the Wikipedia page, a uh, paragraph from him, a colleague who finds taste of cherry excruciatingly boring objects in particular to the fact that we don't know anything about Badil, uh, or, Buddy, to what he sees as the distracting suggestion that Buddy might be a homosexual looking for sex, and to what he sees as the tired distancing strategy of reminding us at the end that we're seeing a movie. The, from the perspective of the history of commercial Western cinema, he has a point in all three counts. But Kurostami couldn't care less about conforming to that perspective, and given what he can do, I can't think of any reason he should care. The most important thing about the joyful finale is that it's the precise opposite of a distancing effect. It does invite us into the laboratory from which the film sprang and places us on an equal footing with the filmmaker. Yet, it does this in a spirit of collective euphoria, suddenly liberating us from the oppressive solitude and darkness of Badi alone in his grave. Shifting to the soldiers reminds us of the happiest part of Badi's life, and a tree in full bloom reminds us of the Turkish taxidermist epiphany. Though the soldiers also signify the wars that made both the Kurdish soldier and the Afghan seminarian refugees, and is a tree uh, where the Turk almost hanged himself. Kiarostami is representing life in all its rich complexity, reconfiguring elements from the preceding 80 odd minutes in the video to clarify what's real and what's concocted. The army is under Kiarostami's command, but it is uh, Irshadi, an architect friend of the filmmaker in real life, who passes Kiarostami a cigarette. Far from affirming that Taste of Cherry is only a movie, this wonderful ending is saying, among other things, that it's also a movie. And we don't have to remember all the lyrics of St. James Infirmary, uh, or Infirmary to know that the death is waiting for us around the corner. So, hey, that guy had the same idea I did about how at first it seems like it's a memory about the happy times of his life mm-hmm. with the army and stuff. Yeah. So uh, I guess I write for the Chicago <laughs> Tribune now. Move over, uh, Jonathan Rosen. Boom, bum, Rosen, boom, bum, Rosen, bum, but you, you old bastard. Hollow. Yeah, uh, I'm coming in. Yeah, uh, yeah, I get it. I, I like this guy's take. Mm-hmm. I like it. I didn't think of it that com- complexly. Is that a word? Doesn't yeah. matter. I didn't think about it that intricately, but I did enjoy it, and I agree with what he's saying. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, sometimes you need like a real uh, film critic to lay things out and play it out. And you go, yeah, no, he's totally right on those fronts. Yeah. Those are things that like I didn't really register because of the way the movie yeah. shot. I don't like there's a minimalist aspect to it that I was more about like just like the character aspect and not the like weird kind mm-hmm. of like, I guess, callbacks to these things that it's interesting to read that because I'm like, oh, I didn't wouldn't have read that at all. So mm-hmm. kudos to the critic yeah. uh, that can actually unpack things well and like pick up on things and like see something in something that others would be like, well, what the fuck's this all about now? <laughs> And I mean, as opposed and, to and, and there's hack, yeah, and there's like something definitely to be said about like uh, the thing about like Western cinema and e- commercial Western cinema and like our expectations of like how movies are supposed to play out, um, right. and like that gets tired and gets old, and uh, but it's weird because like critics expect those things, and even though they don't realize it, and they would say it, they'd be the first person to say, Oh, I don't like that at all either, but then at the same time, they've grown up in these confines of like what mm-hmm. movies are supposed to be, damn it. 
dad. Yeah. I thought that's what you were going to say. <laughs> dad. This is what a movie is supposed to be, dad. <laughs> it's your biker mice from Mars like fan film. Oh. <laughs> right, guys? All right. <laughs> High fives all around. <laughs> um, would you go so far, RJ, to say this is one of the 10 best films ever made, though? Mm, is Spawn on the list? No. Then no. Okay. Then no, I I liked it. I don't think it it didn't fucking blow my mind. I wasn't like up all night like, oh my god, that's the best thing ever. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. is there some people who consider it that? Uh yeah. So supposedly, uh, six notable critics who put it in their uh, 2012 British film mm-hmm. uh, list thing. You do. There's always something like that. You're like, hmm, okay. That seems to be like. It's, it's the uh, social signaling of like, hey, I'm smart and like I, I have really great taste. Even though it's like, well, what movies do you actually like though? Like, I can name at least two Rob Schneider movies that are better than this one. <laughs> but that's I'm not putting it down either. Like, I, I did really enjoy it, but uh, yeah. best ever, no, 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 no. Yeah, this movie's nah. like it seems like its rep has kind of like shifted away. Like, you don't really hear a lot of people talk about this one. Um, really, too Michelle. real. Yeah, well, and then like, um, oh, uh, Kurostami, he died just last year, actually. Um, and he died like it was like shit. It was like a nasty like he just kind of like pretty well keeled over while he was like in Italy. I guess he had like a gastrointestinal cancer, and oh, uh, didn't realize it for a while, and it just kind of got worse from there. So, but well, we we will encounter him again. Uh, he's got a uh, he's got nice. some representation in the Criterion. Uh, actually, his last movie came out not that long ago. That cer- uh, certified copy. You might have seen Avengers that. Avengers too. Yes, uh, you might have seen that one pop up. But yeah, we definitely have uh, the movie Close Up that he did. That I actually watched not that. that long ago. It's yeah. a courtroom drama, and it's like a weird. It's like it kind of goes in the. It's in the same space as the end of this movie, but like blurring that line even more because it's like a documentary and it mm-hmm. might be also a work, but it's like hard to tell. And you also get to experience the like, like absurdity and weirdness of like the Iranian justice system. Which is like uh, I don't know. Whenever I see these movies, it definitely doesn't make me want to travel to Iran anytime soon. <laughs> well, that's where I come in. Yeah. I'm going to Iran next week. So. Oh, that's why. No, we, actually, that's why there's no episode next week. What? Uh, well, let's just say that then. I won't finish what I was saying. Okay. We'll use that as an excuse. Okay. Other than uh, the lack of commitment and unprofessionalism of some. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyways, well, what? <laughs> uh hey so kevin he gave so not a uh reputed film critic but uh, uh just a joe blow from letterbox he gave this movie half a star i really care not how many awards a film receives you simply cannot get away with an ending like this one what went before the final five minutes really counts for nothing in my opinion i'm completely disappointed and i have vowed never to watch another film by this director <laughs> Let him waste someone else's time. If I say I really dislike this film, I would not be able to express a thousandth of my feelings toward it. That's so fucking petty. It's like <laughs> Good day to you, sir. Good day. It's like Steven Spielberg didn't say hi to me at that cafe. I'm never going to watch these movies again. Mm-hmm. Like, shut up. Who cares? Uh, Vargas Ephim something. He gave this movie one star, and his summary of the uh, film is a bored homosexual who tries to pick up guys while obsessed with death. Lethargic doll and unexplained motives. Hashtag still puzzled how this won the Palme d'Or. The... <sighs> That's dumb. There's some there's some questionable movies that have won Palme d'Ors. I don't know if I'd throw this one any shade, you know. Didn't uh, Black Snake Moan win that? <laughs> or Bangkok Dangerous? Uh, Joshua Brown, he gave this one and a <laughs> half stars. Not only was Roger Ebert right, but in my eyes, he declared himself a prophet when he wrote his infamously scathing review of this film. The dialogue in this film was not only banal, but laughably bad. <laughs> Kurosawa no. reaches for profound insights. However, he comes up short and winds up with a deathly dull film. The film's closing shots and behind-the-scenes footage of Kurosawa and his crew are the art house equivalent of lazily stitched together outtakes that one finds in lowbrow mainstream comedies. 
Rather than reminding the audience that oh, that what they watched or suffered through was funny, Kirostami wants us to pat him on the back for putting together something profound. I assure you that he did not. This mm. film won the Palme d'Or in a rare tie. Without having seen the other film, I don't even know what that is, actually. I can going to say a tie? I can only surmise that the jury was split between those who were sane and those who were not. I remember thinking that the Tom Hardy film Locke, which actually came to my <laughs> mind watching this film, was a huh. movie that never fully lived up to its conceit. However, after watching this movie, which shares a similar premise... <laughs> does it no I, not it even remotely other than <laughs> yeah they're just guys in cars uh i can now say retroactively that Locke is a masterpiece in comparison whatever small failures it may have it makes up by not making me want to forget the taste of cherries <laughs> unfortunately oh. you'll have to see the movie to get that joke <laughs> um okay so i have a few very specific comments to this guy yo uh one he's just an asshole who read roger ebert's review before he watched it and was totally tainted by it so fuck him he's an asshole and two uh what is, the fuck does he mean by profit like does he think that roger ebert wrote the review before he read the movie or before he watched the movie because um, it's like i guess he thought that roger ebert was writing to an audience for like that would be proved to be correct oh, shut up. in the future, shut up. <laughs> but shut it's up. like that's not like no, he's a film critic. He's a guy who wrote a review in 1997 about a movie he didn't like. Fine, shut up. It's fine. Hey, I found the uh, it was a tie actually. Okay, what what was um, the other one? Unagi by Shohi uh, Imamura. Sounds, uh, sounds uh, it's Japanese. Yeah. Uh, you fucking racist. That movie was made in Tabor, Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, it's Unagi and uh, translated to The Eel. Mm. Um, oh, so, okay, yeah, yeah. So apparently it uh, double one. Also, fun fact, double apparently one. in double one, in uh, 1997, oh. the opening film for the Cons Festival was The Fifth Element by Luke Besson. Ooh. A movie that I hate. Hey, uh, that uh, people sh- will not agree with that, but fuck them. That, fuck no, it. I, that, I don't like that movie either. Uh, Shohai Imaru, or Imamuru? Yeah, he uh, he's got a lot of criterions. We'll be getting to know him one of these days. Yeah. Is uh, this Unagi in there? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, oh. but he's got a movie called Vengeance is Mine. It's about that a uh, aspiring serial killer. He has a movie called The Pornographers. Uh, and then he's got like that this- one's about us. Yep, and uh, then there's the starring Randy Orton, and uh, there's like a, he's got like a trilogy of movies called like Insect Woman, Pigs and Battleships, uh, Intentions of Murder. Um, yeah, I'm down with that. Cool. I'm down. Hey, is uh, the Fifth Element in Criterion? <laughs> not yet. It's Good. Not, even, not even on Laserdisc, so you you won't have to watch that movie anytime soon. Good. I don't like that movie. Yeah. Any uh, parting shots for uh, Taste Cherry? Taste? I could have used a whole bite. (laughs) And with that, I'm going to take some sleeping pills. (laughs) And after the break, you'll be listening to uh, us talking about making a podcast uh, while smoking cigarettes. And an army will run by. um, And it'll be very profound. (laughs) 